Hi, Bobcats. In this video, we're going to take a look at collision theory, which is a, an explanation of how molecules react. It's based on the simple idea that in order to react, molecules have to collide with one another. From that basic premise, all sorts of details have been developed. Collision theory has a lot of vocabulary associated with it. Words like uh, activation energy and steric factor. So we're going to take a look at all of those and hopefully be able to use all of them correctly by the time we're done with this video. The basic idea here is that all molecules have to collide to react. If two molecules never come close to one another, there's no way they can interact. So once they collide, they have the possibility of reacting. If you do the theoretical calculations to see how often molecules collide, it turns out that reaction rates are much lower than collision rates. So why is that? Well, two of the terms that we use to explain this are a steric factor and an activation energy. So steric factor has to do with the orientation of the molecules. If the business ends of the molecules collide with one another, then the reaction can take place. But if they collide in some other orientation, it won't happen. And then activation energy refers to an, a minimum energy that the collision has to provide in order to kick off the reaction. If the collision doesn't have that much energy, the reaction doesn't happen. Let's first take a look at the steric factor. Um, you'll see this term if you take organic chemistry as well. And when they start talking about steric factors in organic chemistry, they'll be talking about um, the orientation of molecules and the three-dimensional shapes of molecules and how those three-dimensional shapes can um, hinder or help a reaction from happening. Right now, we're, we're going to look at it more as an orientation issue. And if we look at this reaction where two NO molecules react to give us nitrogen and oxygen, well, if these two NO molecules line up so that the nitrogens are together and the oxygens are together, they can start moving their electrons around to break the bond between nitrogen and oxygen and create a new set of bonds between the nitrogen atoms and between between the oxygen atoms. This intermediate state where the old bonds are starting to break and the new bonds are starting to form is called a transition state. And then once all of that electron shuffling is finished, we end up with a nitrogen molecule and an oxygen molecule. Okay, that can happen if the molecules line up correctly to begin with. But what if they collide in a different orientation? If this NO molecule collides head on to the middle of this other NO molecule, the atoms aren't lining up, the electron orbitals aren't lining up, no reaction takes place. Or what if it lines up in this orientation where the nitrogen of one atom uh, of one molecule lines up with the oxygen of the other molecule? Again, in this case, there's going to be no reaction. So the steric factor simply refers to what fraction of the collisions occur with this particular orientation. When we start talking about the energy of these reactions, we typically draw this type of energy level diagram. The vertical axis will be the energy of the molecules. The horizontal axis is something called the reaction progress. I always think of this as being time, um, that if we're early in the reaction, we're over here on the left, and then as time goes by, we end up over here on the right. It's not quite that simple, but that's a good way to think about it. So in, according to this diagram, we're starting off with two NO molecules, and we're ending up with a nitrogen molecule and an oxygen molecule. Along the way, we end up or along the way, we pass through this state up here that's called a, um, uh, a transition state. 
And another term that you will see for this intermediate is an activated complex. And in this transition state or this activated complex, we're starting to break old bonds, which is where those X's are, and we're starting to make new bonds, which is where those arrows are. And um, there's an activation energy barrier. That's what this E sub A stands for. And this, the activation energy barrier is the difference between where you start, which is over here at the reactants, and then the highest energy point that you reach with that transition state. So the activation energy, as it's shown here, is the activation energy for the forward direction of this reaction. If we were to look at this reaction going in the reverse direction, the activation energy would be all the way from down here where the products are up to the top of this transition state. So the activation energy for the reverse direction um, is a little bit bigger than for the forward direction. And I also wanted to point out one more thing here. The difference in energy between the reactants and products is going to be the delta H for the reaction. In order for this reaction to successfully take place when two molecules collide, the collision has to have enough energy to overcome the activation energy. Let's talk about how kinetics and thermodynamics both are portrayed on these energy level diagrams. Uh, let's start with thermo. So if we're going to look at delta H of the reaction, we're going to look at the difference in energy between the uh, reactants and products. So uh, for instance, on this very first one, this is going to be an exothermic reaction. Uh, delta, the, the delta H will be negative. We end up at a lower energy than where we started. Uh, in the case of the second reaction, uh, this is going to be an endothermic reaction because we end up at a higher energy um, than where we started. And in the case of this last one, this also will be an exothermic reaction. Now, if we talk about the activation energy, the activation energy will be the difference between where we start and that uh, activated complex or transition state. So there's our activation energy. Um, for the second reaction, the activation energy would be this difference. That will be our E sub A. And for the third one, we've got just a little activation energy. And the connection we're going to make here with the activation energy is that a big activation energy is going to result in a slow reaction, and a small activation energy is going to result in a fast reaction. So this little activation energy means that it's going to be a fast reaction. Um, this great big activation energy means that it's going to be a slow reaction. So in the, the case of something um, like this very first example, thermodynamics says that the reaction should take place, it's exothermic, um, but the kinetics say this is probably going to be a fairly slow reaction because it's a large um, activation energy. So kinetics will tell us about the speed of the reaction, and that will be on these diagrams related to the size of E sub A. And thermodynamics is going to tell us, is this reaction likely to happen? And exothermic reactions tend to be more likely to happen than endothermic reactions. That's not the whole story. And when we get to our chapter on thermodynamics later this semester, we're going to learn about something called Gibbs free energy, which takes into account 
both the enthalpy change of the reaction and the entropy change. And when you combine both of those factors together, you get a good prediction about whether the reaction can take place or not in terms of thermodynamics. But even if thermodynamics says, yes, this reaction takes place, the kinetics may say that it goes so slowly that it's not observable. Even though thermodynamics says, yes, this should go, you would have to wait around for millions of years to see this reaction happen. When we're talking about collision theory and trying to make a direct connection between collisions and reaction rates, we often look at diagrams like this one. The horizontal axis is energy. And so we have very little energy of collision over here on the left. And as we move over to the right, we have much higher energy of the collisions. Um, the activation energy for some reaction is given right here, where it's labeled E sub A. So this x coordinate is um, equivalent to the activation energy for the reaction. The vertical axis is the number of collisions that are occurring. And we have this plotted for the reaction action at two different temperatures, T1 and T2. T1 is the cooler temperature, and T2 is the hotter temperature. And as the temperature goes up, according to the kinetic molecular theory, the molecules move faster. As the molecules move faster, they have more kinetic energy. So as they collide, those collisions have greater kinetic energy. And so that's what we're seeing in the difference in the curve shape between the cooler curve, the blue one at T1, and the hotter curve, the pink one at uh, T2. And if we look at the area under the curves for temperatures greater than, I'm sorry, for energies greater than the activation energy, we'll see that at the higher temperature, there's a greater area under the curve um, than there is at the lower temperature. So um, at the lower temperature, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of cross hatch this. At the lower temperature, the area under the curve corresponds to how many collisions have energy that exceeds the activation energy and therefore can um, the, the reactions can proceed. Um, but then if we look at the hotter temperature curve, not only do we have that same number of collisions, but now we have all of these additional collisions and crotchets cross-hatching sideways, right? So at um, the higher temperature, there are more collisions that have energy that exceed the activation energy. And so the, there are more collisions that result in reaction. That means that the reaction rate will be faster at the higher temperature. So this slide is just putting into words what was shown in the diagram on the previous slide. At higher temperature, more collisions have energy that's equal to or exceeds the activation energy. So collisions happen more often with a greater number of collisions um, that have um, the right orientation, the right uh, energy, and so the reaction rate will be faster. The Arrhenius equation is um, one that links the uh, rate constant K with temperature. And in fact, the, the form of this equation is linear if our Y coordinate is the natural log of the rate constant and our X coordinate is the reciprocal of the temperature. And that temperature in this case needs to be in Kelvin. And if that happens, then the slope of this line is equal to the negative of the activation energy divided by R. R is the ideal gas law constant, but in this context, we'll want to use the joule value instead of the liter atmosphere value, which is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. So if you know the slope of this line, you can calculate what the activation energy of the reaction is. So why do we go through all these gyrations to get a linear relationship? Well, the linear data analysis is just so much easier when you're not working with computers. So this is kind of a historic artifact. We always try to manipulate our data into a linear form.